Um, I wanted to present the basics of weblock design. This is something that I've been working on for a long, long time. I've been slacklining since 2005. Not very well, but I've been slacklining a lot since 2005. And since about 2010, I've been building my own slackline weblocks. And through the years of building these weblocks, I've come across a lot of information. I've had a lot of talks with uh, some of the best weblock makers in the world, you know, land cruising and, um, well, that's about it. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry's here too. He's, he, I like his weblocks. Anyways, in all this time that I've uh, been building weblocks, I've built, I don't know, maybe 40 different iterations of weblocks and lots of new designs, lots of uh, innovative ideas. In 2010, I came up with a weblock that had, uh, sorry, 2011, I had a weblock that was, uh, had a one-way bearing on it, so you could actually pre-tension it uh, up to almost full walking length, uh, strength. And then several other weblocks later, I've, mailed, I've been a part of many of the evolutions of weblocks. I've never sold any of my own because I just find it to be a hobby. I think it's very fun to do. And then I try to communicate these ideas out to other people who do produce weblocks and hopefully some of the ideas that emanate out a little bit. So in this talk, we're gonna talk about the, uh, the history of the weblocks, the anatomy of it, just basic, the very basics of a weblock. Nothing really crazy, nothing uh, too technical. Um, uh, the design, just the principles behind how you put it together, and some, just a couple considerations regarding construction. There really is, weblocks are an amazing, amazing piece of engineering, and when you look at them, uh, when you look through it and really start to understand uh, some of the physics and engineering that goes behind it, you'd be really impressed with, with, with what some people have made in the weblocks. Um, over the past seven years, the evolution has been phenomenal. So. Where did the web block begin? Well, a lot of us know that slacklining began uh, 1979, I guess, some students from Washington State University, uh, or University of Washington, I can't remember. Anyways, um, these guys would go to Yosemite and they would, uh, on their off time, they would, uh, they would set up some, they would walk on the ropes at Yosemite. And over time, they were like finding out that um, walking on climbing gear was actually kind of fun. They found then walking on webbing was really fun. It was really something special about walking on webbing over a, a rope or a chain. And so as they discovered uh, slacklining, as they started developing it, I mean, it's just a no-name sport. I mean, there's five people doing it in the first five years, or maybe 10 people doing it in the first five years of slacklining. And it wasn't even really thought of as slacklining. I don't even, I, actually, does anybody know where that name came from, when that name was invented? Okay, 200 slackliners here, and nobody knows the history. Um, anyways, uh, so as slacklining developed, you know, they were using climbing gear and carabiners, and, but it was really limited. Uh, slacklining was very limited by the technology that they had available until in 2004 when Scott Balcom, one of the slack daddies, you know, one of our forefathers of slacklining, he invented the slack dog, and that really brought around a revolution in slacklining because now suddenly 20 meters was which was previously thought of as a very long slackline now 30 meters and 40 meters was possible um, 2007 Mich Ashaber uh, sorry if I'm saying that wrong created the banana and most of you know the look of the banana it's a very classic design and it's been copied 10,000 times by 10,000 people um, later uh, Mich Kimita uh, he made a lighter weight version of that and it came out to um, Stefan Junghaus from one of the co-founders of Land Cruising and uh, Matthias Held came out with the Alu Dog, which is, of course, the slack dog, but in aluminum. That was in 2009. Uh, our own Jerry Mischewski, where is he? Somebody point at him? There he is. In 2010, Jerry came out with the Alpine Weblock, and with that, California really started, and from my point of view, California really started exploding with slackline. Partially thanks to Jerry, and partially thanks to all the people that were pushing it at that time. And so from there, we really took off in the evolution of slacklining weblock. 2010 was, I think, the birth of the, the real modern era of slacklining. Um, 
So what is a weblock? How does it look? This is just a, a model that I built on uh, SolidWorks. It's just a CAD model here. But um, I made this just to give an example of how a weblock, the general anatomy of a weblock. You have the rear attachment, sometimes called the rear pin or the uh, shackle attachment, or it depends on what kind of weblock you have, but rear attachment is pretty general and applies to most. Uh, you have the barrel. A lot of people call the barrel, uh, that's the uh, round center diverter there. They call it the center diverter, I call it a barrel. Doesn't matter. Um, there's the pin lock, some kind of, sometimes called the front pin. You have the side plates, you have the uh, load strand, the mainline webbing, and then you have the free strand, or also called the tail. So, the things you need to lock webbing uh, against itself, you, what you need to have to lock the webbing, regardless of whatever components are in a web lock, to lock the webbing itself, you need the barrel, the pin lock, and the rear attachment. You have to have those three components. And the amazing thing about a web lock is when we look at this, I would call this a banana style web lock or a slack dog style web lock based off of the original designs. So with these banana style web locks, you look at it and you take a, a close look at how the physics of it works and you find, okay, we have the classic banana style, but then actually the line lock, you know, the ring with the carabiner, the ring and the shackle, or the chain link and the shackle, whatever the combination might be, that actually works on the same principle as the, as the classic web lock. Um, and the classic web lock, we're used to using it in single wrap configuration, whereas when you have the ring with the carabiner, that would be one and a half configuration, uh, a wrap configuration. There's also the pin lock, which is just basically a steel rod that uh, works the same way as a ring lock works. And the pin lock, <coughs> Land Cruising sells one, a couple other manufacturers sell these, these pin locks. Uh, the pin lock works on the exact same principle as the ring lock, and it just really works, you know, works with a shackle, works with a carabiner. I'm sure most of you are, fam are familiar with that. And the last one, which I consider really funny, uh, is the ratchet. Because the ratchet is a web lock. It uh, has the exact same components as the banana style web lock. The ratchet has two half moons. And these half moons, one of them is the pin, the other is the barrel, and then you have the rear attachment. And then the uh, pins, the, uh, the, the pin and the barrel of the, of the ratchet, yeah, they rotate around and they wrap up the, the web lock two, three, four times, the, the webbing around the web lock. It's still a web lock. Okay, so how does a web lock work? How do the components relate to each other? You have the rear attachment, you have the barrel, you have the, front, the pin lock, the load strand, and the freed strand. So you have the load of the slackline webbing, and then you have this slackline webbing load is coming around the barrel, coming up to the pin lock, and then reversing direction and going back around the barrel and out. And that becomes the free strand. What you're going to have here is quite a lot of load. Say, for, example, for instance, you have a 100 kilogram load that's going around here. And this 100 kilogram load is going to be pressing into this free strand webbing down here. But this webbing wants to go this way. But the free strand webbing wants to go this way. So you have opposing directions. I should have drawn some arrows in here, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you have opposing directions of the webbing here, and you're gonna have quite a bit of friction between those two layers of strands. So, continuing with this idea with how these things relate to each other, we can see that the, the barrel and the pin, in this example, the pin uh, pushes the, the webbing up, into a tangent with the tail, the, the uh, free strand webbing, and that, that's a, tan a tangent up to the, the main webbing. In this, you can see that the rear attachment here creates always, the rear attachment will always create a direct line. The center of the rear attachment will always have, I have a laser pointer, I should use that. The center, <laughs> the center of the rear attachment will always create a direct path of load with the main line webbing. You'll find this no matter how the web lock looks, uh, aside from the uh, ram lock from Slack Tech, but the principle still actually works when you look at it. 
Um, so you see the same thing when you have, say for instance, if you're going to drop the pin down in the construction of a web lock. You can drop the pin down a little bit, the, the, uh, the uh, pin lock down, and the path of load is still going to be directly down the center. And the same thing happens when you push the pin up a little bit with the webbing. And this is something that uh, uh, land cruising and balance community tend to do with their web locks. They usually have the, uh, the front pin pushing up a little bit on the webbing. Whereas, for example, with uh, selectivity with their seahorse, they have it hanging down a little bit. And that's, just to point out, that's a feature that they designed into the system. Um, and it's, uh, there's quite a lot of choices, you can see already, there's quite a lot of choices that the, that the web lock manufacturer has when they design a web lock. And even something as simple as bringing a pin down or pushing the pin up has a very large effect on how the web lock works. And there's an enormous amount of research that goes into these things. And uh, so Balance Community and Land Cruising, they have their research done and they have their opinions on how that works. Other people have different styles that they, that they do. And um, another way to, uh, to take a look at how the relationships works, and these are just a few examples that I'm giving. I mean, this, I'm giving the basics of weblock design here just to, give, just to start the discussion for all of you. Um, so one of the other principles you might have seen in other weblocks is the size, uh, oh, sorry, the, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Um, <laughs> Uh, the relationship of the front pin, of the pin lock, to the barrel. So right here, the pin lock is, uh, in this, in this uh, example that I've drawn here, this is a 30 millimeter barrel with a 12 millimeter pin. Uh, it's about 20, 25 millimeters between the front pin, between the pin lock and the barrel. And here you can see the pin lock moved just a little bit in here, so now we have about uh, 15 millimeters, and you can see the contact angle of the webbing, as it goes around the barrel, the contact area increased. So you can see the difference here, that just moving the pin a little bit in relation to the barrel and in relation to the tangent of the uh, free strand and the main strand webbing. So it makes quite a bit of difference just right here. A small little change of a few millimeters changed quite a bit about how the weblock functions. And here you can see even more, and this has a ton of contact. Now, if you imagine you want to build a web lock, when you want to optimize your web lock, are you really going to want to put your front pin all the way right up here? Because it's going to be really difficult to put your, uh, you know, the little bite of webbing through on your on your web lock. So there's a lot of considerations in that regard to uh, and to how you build your web lock and the, the dimensions. And there's quite a bit of optimization you can really really hone in on here. Next, you can see. Barrel size is another example, and here you can see that the uh, that the contact area of the barrel with a small, very small barrel. This barrel here is 12 millimeters. The pin is 20, uh, 12 millimeters, and you can see the contact area is quite reduced. But who's to say if one is going to be better than the other? That's quite a bit of research you need to do for yourself to find out what what the best is. But um, you can see as you increase the diameter of the barrel. You get a bit more contact area, but what you also get when you get a slightly larger barrel from, say, 12 millimeters, you go up to 20 millimeters or 30 millimeters, you get a lot easier pre-tensioning, you get a lot easier uh, use of the web lock, but you get a lot more weight. And here we go again. You can see as you get larger and larger in the barrel size, it's questionable whether more whether you get any more, much more contact area. Um, so another thing to consider when you're building your web lock is how wide should the jaw be? And some of you might know that this has been an issue that's popped up recently, or a question that's popped up recently. How wide should the jaw be? Uh, I think land cruising goes for 25.5 millimeters, maybe 24.5. Um, and their jaw width, what do you go with, Jerry? Jerry, uh, balance community goes with 26.1 millimeters in the jaw width. Um, I know some other web lock manufacturers that go with larger. In fact, I know um, some people that have made garage web locks that have gone all the way to 30 millimeters uh, jaw width. And what we find with the jaw width, well, 24 millimeters, that's, that's really going to be squeezing the webbing and it may be even causing the webbing to fold a little bit while it sits in the web lock. 
Uh, 25 millimeters might be squeezing it just a bit, but it might be able to sit flat. Um, 26 millimeters tends to sit the webbing quite, quite nice and flat. But what we seem to be finding is 27 millimeters might be just too much. And this is going to be really relative also to the type of webbing you use. Um, actually, I just want to backtrack a little bit here and uh, give you guys the idea of how important dimensions are when designing a weblog. Because the relationship we have to the path of load, the relationship the weblog has to the path of load here, if you're designing your weblog and the side plates and, and the dimensions and how they relate to each other, and you're designing, for example, based on the path of load, uh, you're going to find that the when you choose a webbing of a width, uh, for, for example, for when you're designing a weblog, when you choose a webbing of a width of two millimeters as your example webbing that you're building your weblock around, and then you put a three millimeter webbing into that weblock, it's going to change the relation of how everything fits together. So building a weblock in that regard even is how do you optimize for the webbing? You know, we have uh, Sonic from Land Cruising right here, and you might uh, choose three millimeters for that, but if you're de designing a weblock for Kill Bill, for instance, you might choose a five millimeter thickness. And it's really going to change the dimensions. So there are weblocks out there that are specifically designed for the webbing that they're intended for. Uh, of course, Land Cruising is going to try to hit their target of the most used webbing that they have. Balance Community, I think, will do the same thing. They're going to try to optimize their weblocks for their own systems. Uh, sorry, for their own webbings. And another consideration, when you're making your weblock, is the height of the side plate. And this is something that seems to be an issue that pops up again and again. It's been something that's, it's been an issue that's existed since I started making weblocks in 2010, that I've seen people come out with their own homemade weblocks, and, and some manufacturers have come out with weblocks, that the side plates have been quite uh, shallow, not very tall. And what happens with that is that the webbing, it, as, as we've come to find uh, more and more recently, um, webbing can, can start to hop out of the weblock. And I don't have a good example here uh, in reach, but uh, the tail of the webbing can start hopping out and it hops to the side and it hops up around and slides and gets pinched behind the barrel and eventually the weblock is not even holding the webbing anymore. The webbing is, uh, is not doing that uh, opposing interaction anymore because the tail, the, the free strand, has come all the way out from behind the barrel. So a consideration when building a weblock is having the correct size side plates, uh, having the correct height on the side plates. Um, and, and that's really something that you have to, you really have to build, you know, a lot of web locks. I think at some point we're going to find a, a bit more of a um, stability in the uh, design of web locks as they, as they mature, as, as more manufacturers are building them and more information comes out, more discussions are made about web locks. I think we're going to start to see some more agreement on something as mundane as the height of the side plate. Uh, relative to the mainline webbing. So, last thing to talk about here is the construction. So, I just want to give a really quick example of materials when you uh, are going to build your, your web lock. And I, this is a huge can of worm because uh, there's some people that feel quite passionately about uh, aluminum or, you know, uh, they want to only have steel or, or only titanium. I'm going to limit this just to give a, a thought concept to you guys and, and show uh, just a little thing that comes into how, how to consider the materials you use for your weblock. For example, the side plate, uh, for the pins, and whatnot. Uh, there's something in, when you look up a material, for example, you look up uh, aluminum or you look up uh, steel, uh, for example, 4130 steel has an ultimate tensile strength of about 730 megapascals. And a megapascal is a newton per millimeter squared. And that's just a way to measure what it's, that specific uh, metal will break, or material will break at, at a, um, uh, when it's pulled under tensile stress. So when it's, just, when it's just pulled apart. So 
a thought experiment here is just to take a, a theoretical material. And does anybody have a weblock handy? No. Okay. Yeah, I'm hoping to have one in my hands. Um, anyways, say for instance, uh, you choose a material of 500 megapascals, and then you want to take, you want to maybe calculate. This, by the way, this is just a calculation. It does is not at all a substitution for actual testing. If you make your weblocks, you must destroy a lot of your weblocks before you ever trust them. Anyways, when you have your side plates, uh, you take a cross section. Say for example, where the uh, just got to go back. You take a cross section. Say right here, for example. Say this weblock, the side plate is two millimeters wide, and we'll just say for example, 25 millimeters uh, down along this way. You take that cross section, 2 times 25, that's 50 square millimeters of, um, of area on that cross section. Now, you can take those two numbers, the 500 megapascal uh, um, uh, ultimate tensile strength, and then you take the uh, side plate area, you plug those two together, so that would be 50 millimeters squared, 50 square millimeters, times 500 newtons per millimeter squared. That gives, you an, that gives you the minimum breaking strength, and please don't confuse that with an actual tested minimum breaking strength, but that gives you a minimum breaking strength of 25,000 newtons, which is 25 kilonewtons. You have two side plates, that makes 50 kilonewtons just like that. Okay, that was just a thought experiment. It was just to get your brains working on how to look at the materials and and if you want to make your own web lock and you see some material that's, you know, 1,800 megapascals and you're just like, you get big hearts in your eyes like, oh my God, I'm going to do that. This is going to be the strongest web lock in the world. Go for it. But uh, everything you do, if you make your own web locks, you must destroy them in a real scenario. Don't, uh, don't put on uh, some uh, uh, mil spec webbing and pull it until the mil spec break and says, oh, this web lock didn't break at... 18 kilonewtons, so it's good for 25. I mean, that's happened. And testing is something that's going to happen more and more in the future. Um, just get into that idea. I'm going to put a pin in that idea for just a moment. Um, the next thing is, when you manufacture your weblock, and say you want to use steel for your weblock, and your side plates, you want to cut the side plates out. Well, how are you going to come out? cut them out? A lot of people are going to go to a machine shop. It's really easy. You go to a machine shop, you pay them five bucks, five euro, and they'll cut out this plate for you if you have a CAD drawing for them. You just say, hey, I want this. And then for five dollars, they, they, they'll make it for you. I've made weblocks since 2010 using machine shops where they laser cut it, they plasma cut it, they water jet cut it. But what happens when you cut this, this little plate out of a piece of metal? You're going to have really sharp edges. And what happens with the sharp edges, it just cuts the webbing. And unfortunately, over the years, we've had several people um, who wanted to corner the market on really cheap weblocks. You guys all know, weblocks are fucking expensive. Why are they expensive? When you manufacture a weblock and you have to do something as simple as round out the edge of the, of the side plates, make it so it's not sharp, that right there took that $5 cut maybe into... A, Fifteen, twenty dollars, and so when you're going to make a weblock, you must not allow sharp edges to be on the weblock. And think about it this way: if you want to make a weblock in your garage, that's great. Go for it and and sand down the edges and and break a bunch of them before you feel confident enough to use it. But when you have something like that, that weblock could last for fifty years. I mean, who knows where where slack lining is going to go and and how gear is going to continue to be used. But think about it, like 10 years of use out of one weblock. I've seen some people's 10-year-old weblocks that they still use. And you're going to use those weblocks for 10 years. Those weblocks are going to have sharp edges for 10 years. You know how to rig that weblock really nice, really well, because you know how to make it so those sharp edges don't ever contact the webbing. But somebody else that borrows your gear or some other person that, that you know, goes and re-rigs your, your, your line, or any number of scenarios, you got to have, you got to just do it right. Um, we've had we've had Highline failures from sharp metal. Um, one once was a sharp metal um, uh, line glide, contributed heavily to a person falling. Both cut through both the main line 
and the backup, and the, and the person fell eight meters, luckily onto crash pads. But, and we've had other uh, failures from, from sharp web locks. We've had, I mean, I've seen them in the park, and I've seen the, uh, some manufacturers who want to uh, get, their, get their web locks out, get their name out, just get their, their feet wet, and they start selling web locks with really sharp side plates, and they cut the corner, so to speak. And unfortunately, they don't round that corner off again. Because they cut corners to sell the cheap web locks, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody, I'm not trying to point out any manufacturers that may be in here that uh, do that or, or have done that. But this is a very serious problem. You want to buy that 30, 30 euro web lock, you want to be like, okay, well the Alpine web lock is way beyond my budget, I can never afford that, but I can't afford this really cheap one. And you go out and buy this really cheap web lock, and you, you're like, oh great, I finally got it, I can really start pushing. But is it worth it? I mean, really, is that worth it? You're going to be putting your life on your line, your friend's life on the line, and I don't think it's worth it. So, sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm passionate about that one. That one really gets to me because um, I've known, I've known my friends to have weapon that have snapped on them while they're on the line and they got injured. Um, and thankfully, we've not had anybody die from this scenario. But it's a real, it's a real chance, and it's something I care very deeply about. Um, so, just to round this off, rounding out. The edges is a little bit expensive, but it's worth it. Make sure that you do that if you make your own web blocks. And so just really quickly, I want to um, uh, bring up the ISA, the International Cycling Association. It's a possibility in the future that the ISA might be making a uh, label, a safety label, for example, for web blocks or for any other pieces of cycling gear. And this is, a, this is an interest for us, but it's a very, very, very difficult process. And um, so we're going to be talking on Saturday about, uh, the, we're going to have uh, four people here from the ISA. We're going to we're gonna have Sarah, uh, Jed, Chill, and me. We're going to get up and do a small presentation about what the ISA is. Uh, Sarah and I will talk about memberships and whatnot. Jed and Chill will talk about um, uh, the uh, safety commission, which Chill is the uh, president and Jed is the vice president. Is that right? Of the safety commission? Research director. Um, okay, so thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate it.